or express your interior subjective self through the commodities you purchase? No, I don't believe you will. But that hasn't stopped me. Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be talking about, um, talking about, um, logos. I know in my last video I said I'd be doing a review of the bag that Acne Studios gives you clothes in when you buy them. But Hi, it's Betty. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about um, logos on clothing. So, as usual, I have to place a disclaimer. I'm a staunch historical materialist, um, exploring the phenomenon of conspicuous consumption, not condoning it. Uh, if anything, I am really condemning it, but once I'm drawn to expensive things and fashion like a fly to a lamp. Nonetheless, all material commodity leaves me empty. Next, I'd like to say that I really want to develop a critical language to discuss fashion that does not separate aesthetic framework from its economic framework or its social framework because I'll get to this in a bit again but the, the, the aesthetic origins of luxury are economic inaccessibility. That's an a priori assumption I'm making but I will stand the fuck by that. Yeah, I'd love to almost develop something on the level of like a meta language to discuss fashion. I can't believe there isn't critical theory surrounding it considering it's like, I don't know, the third largest polluting industry on the planet. Is it because it's frivolous? Is it because it's associated with gays and women? I don't know. Anyways, here I am. Um, but today, anyways, we're discussing logos, and uh, the, I, I did a cursory search of the internet, and I could not find anyone that had outlined the differences I'm about to outline between logos. Um, but there are, in my view, essentially three types of logos. Explicit logos, like um, the supreme red brick, which we'll get to in a bit. Patagonia's little thing of mountains um, with the word Patagonia on it. Um, the Coca-Cola logo. Um, words, images, abstractions, lettering, um, it's, you know, the physical logo image. Sounds pretty straightforward. The third, uh, sorry, the second category is um, a design trademark, like a visual, formal piece of design, the desi a design of the actual element of the product being produced that is uh, trademarked, which is what will separate category two from category three. But examples of this, um, of these design trademarks include like Burberry plaid, Adidas stripes, oh, the red bottom on a Louboutin shoe. It's not like Adidas owns all stripes. They just own the rights to use them in certain ways. Um, and so on. And then, um, yeah. And finally, we come to implicit logos, which are features and forms that you can't put onto a different commodity without making implicit reference to the brand that invented or most prominently used that feature or form on any piece of design or commodity. Uh, this includes uh, like a lock on a handbag, which at least for me always, you know, screams Hermes. A, um, a slot on the toe of a shoe, which for me screams Maison Margiela. Even though the tabby boot is actually a traditional form of Japanese footwear, I ask you to Google the whole story of the Antwerp 6 before you comment upon that. Um, it's interesting, the story of that shoe and of the design, you know, like group culture that Martin Margiela was in. I, I'm, you know, we all have a problematic fave. Another example of an implicit logo at this point is like the sneaker sock, which Balenciaga really like culturally owns, even though Rick Owens did that first. You know what Rick Owens also did first? Held a hyper-realistic sculpture of his own head long before this Gucci show. But that's a topic for another video. So three kinds of logos, explicit, design trademark, and implicit. Explicit logo is a logo. Design trademark is like the Adidas three stripes. Implicit logo is something like um, a lock on a handbag. What does that all mean? It asks us, I think, to really consider the implications of logos on clothing. Why do people wear them? And why do companies use them? I personally am much more interested in, because um, you know, there's been so much economic and marketing discourse on like why, why companies use logos, the importance of logos. Like, we all watched Walmart rebrand. Um, we've all watched Balenciaga rebrand. It's, 
it's your public image. It's a way you re maintain recognizability. It's also, um, when you put a logo on a piece of clothing and a person wears that clothing, they're also a free advertisement for you. In some, company, some countries, there are no logo-free cigarette boxes and they just have like smoking kills and like a picture of like a person with like a stomata or something in their neck because when you wear a logo or interact with something, consume something, a commodity with a logo on, you're advertising for that company for free. So um, that's that. Why pay to be a commercial for someone? Why wear a logo? What's the point? As I mentioned in my first video, simply to tell everyone that you can wear this logo, that you can afford to buy this thing that this logo is associated with, that you can, you know, you have enough money to wear this, literally. I think that, um, back to my earlier point, um, sorry, the aesthetic origins of luxury are rooted in what is accessible and what is inaccessible. Rarity, hard to getness. like, um, think about gold or jade or an obsidian dagger or copper or like something like like that that reddish purple dye that the Greeks were obsessed with that you had to like get sea snails in order to you know dye all your royal tapestries that color people want to wear their money on themselves and uh, why the logo is such an interesting thing here rather than like well why don't you talk about gold jewelry and conspicuous consumption or something like that because the, the logo has a very certain set of like legal and social functions that we're going to get into in the rest of the video like logos are a very clear and direct way that you can say how much you spent on something and i know that there are some exceptions to this like you know like if you're buying tactical gear or like climbing gear or like i don't know you know something really utilitarian that just has to be really good quality and costs a lot of money and there are objects that even like blur the boundaries between like you paying for quality or logo but um you know exactly you know exactly what i'm talking about by the end of the video when i say like logos are about how much money you spent on something the aesthetic and financial value of logo stems from the idea of rarity. We live in a time where rarity is very seldom, at least in the United States where I am, very seldom is there actual rarity. Most rarity is simulated, kind of like how um, you know farmers are subsidized to burn their extra crops and um, a lot of high-end fashion labels will burn unsold merchandise. Uh, rarity is very often actually there. Um, and companies can simulate rarity and do as they um, need to generate a market for their clothing. It's kind of like supply generates demand and rare, you know, the fewer things that are, the more ostensibly people pay for them. A great example of this um, is Supreme, back to Supreme. I don't know if I've mentioned it yet, but God, Supreme is gonna feature a lot in this video. Uh, Supreme is an example of like, an underproduction model of clothing. Like they literally, with like all the hype surrounding their drops and the fact that you know that not everyone will be able to get it, you want it, um, whether or not you actually want it. Like, like look at hype beast culture and equally interesting, sneaker culture. The rarity of sneakers, like limited edition shoes. For this to develop just around a sneaker, like how, who cares? Aren't sneakers supposed to be utilitarian sportswear? No, they're not. And logos are what generate that distinction, almost always. Um, yeah, Supreme's evil genius is the underproduction model. Um, but what does this have to do with logos? I posit that logos are a mechanism that allows us, in an age where so much wealth can be simulated by buying like fake diamonds, jewelry that looks like gold, um, fake handbags, you can buy a fake iPhone, and so on. Um, a lot of past, like historical past signifiers of wealth can be simulated. So what are the rich people to do? They're so tasteless, what are they gonna do? They're gonna buy something with a logo on it. They're gonna buy a Canada Goose jacket or something. Um, you know, and logos can also be used to like signify something like social, um, social, like being part of a social in-group, like, you know, like hype beasts. There's as much like commodity, um, like wealth, like uh, economic commodity value as there is like social commodity value. You know, capital and also social capital, being part of an in-group. I'm not an expert on hype beast culture, and um, someone, can, anyone can correct anything I say in this video. Okay, simulated wealth. We can simulate wealth. The mass market is hypersaturated. It does that. It's really good at doing that. You can buy a current season look at Zara, even though it was made at a sweatshop by a suffering person, possibly in the south of Asia. You're still gonna buy it, right? Because you want to simulate wealth. Because you want to be 
you just want it. We're just compelled to do this like socially by some like fucked up internal and social mechanism that just makes us want this garbage. And we keep doing it even though we know it's wrong. Like eating chickens. So logos get around um, the idea that you can simply simulate wealth, even though of course you can make a fake handbag, you can buy a fake whatever. But logos are unique in that they have a legal apparatus of copyright and trademark laws that enforce originality. Like the aura of an original work of art, kind of, you know? There is something about, and it's a socially constructed thing, something about, like, an original Celine bag that's like, oh, you know, that like, for some reason when you know it's fake, it's it, it just like loses, this, this ephemeral thing just vanishes. And what allows logos to pack such a punch and what has essentially heralded the rise of the logo in the 21st century is the legal apparatus that holds up logos. Simple as that, a simulation, of course. Back to Supreme and Louis Vuitton. I mentioned Supreme because the brand basically is its logo and nothing else. Um, that collab in particular, Similarly, how, how the Supreme Comme des Garçons collab did blurs the object logo boundary, which Supreme does all the time, by the way. Um, there was, I remember that one duffel, a really big Supreme duffel bag, where if you view the duffel bag exactly from the side, it literally just is a red rectangle with the word Supreme on it. The object and the logo merge into one. There is no boundary. The whole object is red and it has the word Supreme on it. It's like the logo hyper realized, hyper manifested into just this fucking commodity form. That's like, you know what? That's nuts. The, I can't believe that this is so interesting. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the logo just hyper manifested into this big commodity form, which you still want to buy. I mean, it's a bag. A bag does work for you. A bag holds things. Um, but then when you hyper commodify something, like you don't want to scuff it up. You don't want to hurt it. Like common projects. People who clean their common projects are cucks. I don't have much more to say on that, but if you clean your common projects, you're a cuck. This is commodity fetishism. Karl Marx describes commodity fetishism as the conflation or like transmutation of economic relationships into social relationships. I lose the ter use the term pretty loosely often, but it really is like a conflation of like the economic value of something, which in of itself is a simulacrum hiding the truth of its own absence, of its own untruth. Taking that like this is worth a lot of money, and turning that into like this complex social relationship and hierarchy surrounding what logos and what brands people wear, which you see, by the way, on all levels of consumption. Like from fucking like Timberland boots up to like Balenciaga speed trainers, back down to vans and over to Tiva sandals when you're on a hiking trip in the Grand Canyon, you know? So that's, so that's commodity fetishism. But Supreme, as a brand, is like a perfect embodiment of commodity fetishism because the brand is only its logo. You can, like when Supreme sold literally a brick with the Supreme logo in it, I was shook. I was like, what self-awareness? Supreme's also just sold a crowbar. And how different is that really from them selling a hoodie or a t-shirt or a hat? Or a lighter or a beer bottle opener? I'm just like thinking of like, what else would Supreme sell? Whatever. A brand that is its logo is something very distinctly 21st century, I think. We also see it sometimes in like tech, um, the way Supreme can just branch out and grab onto something. Kind of reminds me of like how Amazon used to just be an online bookseller, but now it's literally everything. Like Amazon Web Services hosts like two thirds of the internet or something ridiculous like that. It's just an entity with capital that can do. It's just its logo, it's just itself. It's now just for a little bit of structure of this criticism. When a brand is only a logo, what does that mean? Supreme in particular helps us to say that if we boil this down to an extreme essence, brand equals logo. Thinking back to Pierce and Levi Strauss, a logo, as we mentioned earlier, is an image or an icon, and an icon is a can be read as a symbol or signifier of other things. An icon can be a signifier. We definitely see images and they signify to us. That is how logos work. And if you empty out a signifier, if you generate what Levi Strauss called a floating signifier, something with no set or agreed upon meaning, you create a lifestyle brand, which is what Supreme is. It's a lifestyle brand, a, lo a brand that is a logo, brands that are, sell are signifiers and brands that sell signifiers are lifestyle brands. 
Isn't that amazing? Like Goop by Gwyneth Paltrow. It sells signifiers of certain tastes and sensibilities and often signifiers of wealth as well, or like social inclusion, which uh, brings us back to commodity fetishism, you know? Will you ever express your interior subjective self through the commodities you purchase? No, I don't believe you will. But that hasn't stopped me. So, this reminds me of a thing I read, which I'll link below because the whole series is on YouTube, and that John Berger BBC series from like the 70s called Ways of Seeing. It just has sublime 70s aesthetics, by the way. Must watch. Um, a real homie, John Berger. Um, that hallowed monetary value and fanaticism generated around art by the art market is a substitute for what art lost when technology gave us the ability to mechanically reproduce art and to take an image out of its original context. Before mechanical reproduction, when even like you had to, you know, try to get a print of an artwork, like just a woodcut, please, a woodcut, right? Now you just, you photograph everything. And this happened over the course of the 19th century. And so did, and the art market developed over the course of the 20th century and also kind of the 19th century. But you have to replace that rarity and sanctity that was generated around like, for instance, painted images where like an ineluctable material condition of viewing a painted image was viewing the space it was set in. You would not be able to view it outside of that space. And now we can all just go and look at a picture of the Sistine Chapel online. Or if anyone saw that Michelangelo show at the Met, they made one on the ceiling, and which was a crazy simulation if you think about it, which was also really nice to see. So I'm kind of on the fence about that one. Simulation breeds fetishism is what I've read out of this. Commodity fetishism in particular. Um, in the same way that, you know, art, Images can be simulated and therefore you generate this crazy fanaticism about the around the original image and its market value, like, you know, a Rothko. An image of a Rothko is not worth what a Rothko is worth. And a fake is not worth what a real handbag is worth, but there, there's like this, this craze just develops around something when it- So in an age of wealth simulation through fashion, fast fashion, thrifting, and fakes, it makes sense of that the logo is so much on the rise because the legal apparatus stands partially though not always in the way of simulating things such as logos, so that they still have signifying power for the most part. At least the power to signify how much money you spend on the thing you're wearing. It's not like a perfect um, comparison, but I think the comparison stands. You know, fast fashion, mass production, the internet and market saturation have done what the camera once threatened to do to art. Like art, fashion survived, but it came out crippled and maimed an empty set of signifiers filled by us fetishists. I remember there was once a documentary on Netflix called Valentino, The Last Emperor, and one of the people being interviewed said, um, they call him the last emperor because since then fashion has fallen to the tradesmen. I'm sure it's a notion we can all relate to. We need to extricate and separate our self-image, our impulse to spend and consume, our personal creativity, and the social conventions that we use to visually communicate from this commodity fetishist late capitalist model of consumption. Cowards, will you fight or will you perish like a dog? Grow up. Stop buying garbage. Anyways, thanks for watching my video. Like and subscribe below. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on this. Treat the comment section like Martin Luther treated the door that he nailed the 95 theses to. Thanks for watching.